Okay, so let's talk about pre-implantation genetic testing. So it's important to just point out that pre-implantation genetic testing comes in different forms and flavors, so to speak. You can do pre-implantation genetic testing for mutations, which would be like single gene mutations like cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs, sickle cell, um, et cetera. As long as there's a coordinate for a mutation to probe for, you can test an embryo for it. And it doesn't matter, autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant, X-linked, um, X-linked recessive. As long as you can, again, probe for it, you can test for it. Structural rearrangements are another form of pre-implantation genetic testing that is similar in complexity and sophistication as pre-implantation genetic for, for testing for mutations, which re requires sometimes some probes to be constructed depending on the location of the rearrangement. Aneuploidy screening is probably the most basic form of pre-implantation genetic testing as essentially what it amounts to is a selection tool that helps you uh, determine whether there are any deletions or duplications in whole chromosomes 1 through 22 X and Y. This is currently um, used a lot in IVF as some people use it as an adjunct to IVF. Essentially, it's an optional part of the IVF process. Um, the way to think about it is to think about it as a selection tool that goes above and beyond the standard non-invasive morphologic-based assessment. So let's talk about this type of pre-implantation genetic and spend some time uh, talking about it. These two, these two types are pretty patient-specific, right? Patient has a genetic mutation, patient has a specific structural rearrangement and keeps, patient has a structural rearrangement and keeps miscarrying, you know, Selecting embryos against the rearrangement will improve their chances of having live birth. Um, so goes the logic. Um, in this particular case, people who have a child that has a severe life-threatening or life-shortening disease, you know, they want to reduce their risk of having another child with that disease or having a child with that disease if the, both parents are determined to be carriers. So there's very little controversy about the use of pre-implantation genetic testing in these scenarios. This one has a little more controversy about its application, and the reason for that is because the indication for it is still a little dubious. Um, there's some there's a movement to make it an empiric part of IVF, but there's still some resistance to that because the data has not borne that out, that it is actually valuable as a standard part of IVF. So in its current form, PGT with for aneuploidy remains an optional part of IVF that amounts to a selection tool that goes above and beyond the current standard. So if we go back to our picture here um, about how we selected an embryo, and let's kind of re let's redraw that out here. So how does IVF with PGTA work? You create an embryo. Let's say you have multiple embryos on, thir on the third day that look good. And in our program, we said if you have four, then you'll grow everything out to the fifth day. And then on the fifth day, you'll select the best embryo and transfer. So... IVF in its current form, the holy grail of IVF is selection, okay? And what I mean by that is, how do I know which embryo is going to lead to live birth? So going back to this picture, how do I know that which embryo is going to lead to live birth and how do I select that embryo? So we talked at the cleavage stage that there are certain morphologic characteristics, although they're not very good, that we use to kind of decide whether an embryo is favorable or not. But if you have lots of embryos that look good, how do you select amongst those? Well, one tool is to grow the embryo in culture. So what we do is we grow the embryo for two more days in culture. And this has only been um, refined over the last 10 to 15 years. So we're really good now at growing embryos in culture and replicating, re replicating the um, embryo's needs in, in vitro in the lab. Because between day three and day five, there's a big switch that goes on in the embryo's nutritional needs, in its DNA transcription. Essentially, on day three, the embryo is still reliant on the maternal genome to drive its growth. However, after the third day, it turns on its own genome and the embryo starts to drive, the embryo's genome, genome is now activated and it starts to drive its own development. So if you get out here to day five and you have lots of good looking embryos on the fifth day, how do you know which of those embryos are the best? How do you pick from those embryos which is the best? Well, we use a non-morphologic, or we use a non-invasive, so the current standard is a non-invasive morphologic assessment. 
So you look at the embryo on day five, you look at its characteristics, and if you see favorable characteristics, a good quality embryo on the fifth day in our program gives you a 60 to 65% chance of pregnancy with one embryo, with one embryo transfer. So that's important, right? Because the goal is one healthy baby. If you have two embryos that look good, people used to hedge and say, well, let's just transfer both of them. But the twin rate can be as high as 24 to 40%. So we wanna lower that. And one way to lower that is to transfer one embryo. So by better selecting which embryo is likely to implant, you can enhance your success rate with, uh, with one embryo. So by growing the embryo longer in culture, you can better select which of those day three embryos are likely to be the ones on the fifth day that are the best. And then from those day five embryos, you can pick the best one. Now, the role of pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy is an invasive genotypic tool that helps us assess what's the chromosomal makeup of the embryo. And it's predicated on the uh, idea that most embryos do not implant because the embryo is chromosomally abnormal or aneuploid. So if you can select out of the day, out of the em cohort of embryos that you have, which ones are aneuploid, then you can improve your uh, accuracy in your position and improve your chances of live birth with one, uh, with the transfer of one euploid embryo. So by doing pre-implantation, put another way, by adding pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy to the selection process, you might add, give yourself an extra five to 10% chance of success. What might also happen is you might have a lower miscarriage rate as well because aneuploidy is a common cause of miscarriage. So these are the selling points that are typically, we typically give to patients, hey, you might have a higher chance of success, you might have a lower miscarriage rate. And I say selling points because this is what the data would show, but there's still a lot of controversy about whether this technology is actually should be applied empirically to everybody. So there are some clinics that might apply it to everybody and who doesn't want a higher chance of success and a lower chance of miscarriage. The thing is it might not apply to everybody that those success rates and those outcomes, i.e. higher chance of success, lower miscarriage rate. So it has to be applied on an individual basis because it, currently there isn't enough data to help us understand who would benefit the best which population. So currently in my practice, for example, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy is applied on a case-by-case -case basis. I talk to every patient about it, and if they wanna do it, great. If they don't, we move on. It adds additional cost to the process as well. So how it works is it works by essentially growing all the embryos out to the fifth day, and then you biopsy the trophectoderm cells. These are the cells out here that become the placenta and then you freeze the embryo. So you biopsy, and then you freeze the embryo, okay? And then once the embryo is frozen, then you will take the five to six cells that you biopsied, process them, and then send them to a reference lab. So there are lots of reference labs that, uh, there are two or three reference labs that are generally used in the country. Some clinics have their own uh, in-house pre-implantation genetic testing platform already. Uh, most do not, and most use the reference lab. Um, so for pre-implantation genetic for aneuploid, testing for aneuploidy or for mutations or structural rearrangements, regardless of the indication for PGT, this is, it's the same thing. You grow the embryos out to the fifth day, you biopsy the trophectoderm cells, you freeze the embryos, and then you wait five to 10 days until you get the results. And when you get the results, if you're doing aneuploidy screening, you'll get um, a printout that shows chromosomes one through 22, X and Y. And then they'll tell you whether there are deletions or duplications in those chromosomes, or if they're not. You can, uh, you can also blind the report so that you don't know the sex of the embryo if the patient does not wanna know. And then it'll tell you whether, the patient, whether, whether those embryos are affected or unaffected depending on whether you're also doing mutation testing at the same time. So if you're doing mutation testing, you'll get a printout that says affected, unaffected. So to give you a sense of what that looks like, here's a example of what a TE biopsy looks like. Here the um, embryo is being biopsied. Um, these cells, a laser is used to uh, make a hole in the zona pellucida. And then those cells that are the trophectodome are gradually suctioned out 
Remember the inner cell mass ultimately becomes the fetus, the trophectoderm ultimately becomes the placenta. So you're essentially taking the cells that will become the placenta and amplifying them and running on an array, either with a SNP array or a CGH array, you're looking to see if there are gains or losses in those chromosomes. We've now moved to next gen sequencing. Um, many clinic or many of the reference labs have moved away from array and SNP and are now doing next gen. Now, the problem with, with the aneuploidy screening, I mean, I, again, the pros are you get higher chance of success with a lower chance of miscarriage. The cons are it does require an invasive procedure on the embryo, which up to this point has not been shown to be um, harmful. We do know, however, that it is harmful to biopsy an embryo on the third day, and that leads to lower pregnancy rates. But we do not know if that's the same as true yet on day five. Current data would suggest it does not, or current conventional, let me not say current data, conventional wisdom currently is that it does not um, in the absence of uh, any data, but we don't know yet. And we don't know if biopsying is going to be harmful to the embryo and cause some problems later in life. As far as we know, it does not, but we haven't, we're only at about five years into biopsying embryos at a large scale on the fifth day. So stay tuned. Let's see. We talked about the testing requires biopsy and cryopreservation. That is another con um, that's sometimes a pro, depending on how you use it. So freezing the embryo makes the patient wait a month before they can have the transfer. But we also know frozen embryo transfers lead to babies that have higher birth weights. Um, so there is some, there may be some benefit to doing the frozen transfer. The other thing that's a concern is that three to 5% of the time there's mosaicism. So three to 5% mosaicism rate. So that means that the like the, the results that you get might be wrong. So that's a little concerning. Um, you might discard an embryo or not transfer an embryo that actually could have led to a live birth, but because the report was abnormal, you elected not to transfer it. Um, that's reasonable logic, but it's again important to tell patients that there's a three to five percent mosaicism rate. It also does it does cost additional money, and most people don't have coverage for IVF, so they're already spending sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars for the whole thing, and another thirty five hundred dollars. You know, does it make sense to spend that money? For some people, adding the genetic testing probably doesn't change their outcome. Um, for others, it's important and they want to do everything possible. So I leave it up to the patient. If the patient comes in and wants to do the testing, we do the testing. If they're indifferent about it and I don't think it's going to help them, I'll tell them that. So again, how does IVF and PGTA work? You have some number of embryos on the third day. You grow them out to the fourth day. You biopsy and freeze. And then you get a report back on those embryos. Let's say this one is 46XX, and then this one is 45XO, just to make it simple. So this is an embryo that you would not transfer. Now, some people would argue, well, it could still lead to a live birth, in which case the patient has Turner syndrome. But the more likely outcome is that it would lead to miscarriage. Um, the other examples you'll get are, you know, you might get a trisomy 16, you might get a, um, you might get gains in, tri in chromosome 16, 11, 12. I mean, it's all over the place, two, four, seven deletions um, in those chromosomes. So you're not screening for specific aneuploidies that have some known um, live birth outcome. You're screening the entire chromosome 1 through 22, X and Y, and you're looking to see if there are any deletions or duplications with some pretty high, with some level of resolution. And if there are, then that embryo is likely to, is aneuploid, and an aneuploid embryo is likely to lead to no pregnancy and or miscarriage, and very rarely actual live birth. So that's why we term these aneuploid embryos as not suitable for transfer. And then we would select out of the bunch, we would say, okay, this is the euploid embryo, so let's go ahead and select that one and transfer it. And again, in this case, we know the sex of the embryo. Uh, remember, embryos have a sex, they do not have a gender. Embryos have a sex, they do not have a gender. Sex is a biological term, gender is a, uh, is a term that is a reference to one's self-identification of their gender identity.
and not a commentary on their biologic sex and the gender that's assigned based on that. So again, I always, people talk about, as an aside, people talk about gender selection of an embryo and I always correct them that you're actually not testing the gender of the embryo. It's technically you're selecting the sex of the embryo. So it's a biological grammar point I always like to make. So we talked about how PGTA works. And again, this is a complicated topic. So if you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask. 